Assalamualaikum, salam sejahtera and hello everyone. In our last session, we looked at the formulation of oblique shock waves, weak versus strong shocks and attached versus detached shocks. In this session, we will look at some examples on the techniques to solve problems related to the oblique shocks. We will look at two sample problems to work on. As in our previous cases, I'm going to show the concept and the strategy on how to solve these problems. Once we are clear about this, the actual process of solving the problems will become easier and rather straightforward. It mostly uses the concept and applies the techniques that we've learned previously for normal shock waves. In question 1, a supersonic flow with m equals to 2.5 passes over a wedge with a half angle of 10 degrees. The wedge is placed symmetrically in the flow, which means the angle of attack is zero. We need to find the ratio of stagnation pressures before and after the shock, which is P01 over P02. We'll divide our problem into three steps understand, strategize, and solve. The key procedures in each step are as listed in the box here. Using this approach, the most important steps are the first two. The last step is pretty straightforward once you got the first two right. So, let's go to step 1, which is to understand the problem. We have a wedge with a half angle of 10 degrees at an angle of attack of 0 degrees. Sometimes, instead of the half angle, a problem may quote the full angle of the wedge, also called the included angle, which is 20 degrees in this case. We have in region 1 a flow at Mach 2.5 passing over the wedge. Technically, this is the free stream region, which can be represented more accurately with the infinity symbol. But in the context of solving specific problems, there's no issue if we use the simpler numbering system, as long as we are consistent. Because there is an inclined surface of 10 degrees, the flow will be deflected at the same angle. But since we have a supersonic flow, the flow can only be deflected across an oblique shock wave, as shown in the diagram. Our task is to find the ratio of P01 over P02. Since stagnation pressure reduces across a shock, that ratio should be bigger than 1. In our strategy, we'll focus more on just the flow and the oblique shock, as shown in the picture here. We need to decompose the flow mark numbers into their tangential and normal components before and after the shock. What's important is the normal components, so we'll focus on that only, which is MN1 before the shock and MN2 after the shock. The equations for these two normal components can be obtained from the trigonometric relations, which we have covered in our previous video. Here, MN1 is M1 sine beta, but we don't have beta yet, which is the shock angle. Beta can be found from the oblique shock chart, which plots and relates between three different parameters, M1, beta, and delta. Since we know M1, which is 2.5, and delta, which is 10 degrees, we can find beta. Once we have MN1, we can treat the problem as a normal shock problem. And the easiest way is to use the normal shock table to get the parameters across the shock by taking the MN1 value that we just calculated to be the M1 value in the table. The other parameters in the normal shock table are paired with the actual parameters in the problem as shown here in the box. For example, MN2 is read off as M2 in the table, but the physical flow properties, i.e. the temperature, pressure or density, are the same for a normal shock or for an oblique shock, as long as the normal component crossing into the shock is the same. The stagnation pressure ratios can also be read off directly from the table, which can be inverted to P01 over P02 afterward. With this concept and strategy, I would recommend that you work it out yourself to find the final answers, to make sure that you are clear about this. In question 2, we have a wedge with an included angle of 12 degrees 
an angle of attack of 4 degrees, a Mach 2.3 flow, and a static pressure P1 of 60 kPa. We need to find the pressure difference between the upper and lower surfaces of the wedge. When we draw the diagram to understand the problem better, we need to be careful with its geometry, especially on its angle of attack. Recall that the standard definition of alpha is the angle between the free stream and the core of the object. I would advise that we draw the free stream to be horizontal and then draw the wedge at the inclined position relative to the free stream. Looking at the diagram, we have the flow passing over the top surface. Because of the inclined surface, the flow will be deflected in region 2 after crossing an oblique shock wave. From the geometry, we'll get the deflection angle to be 2 degrees. At the bottom surface, there'll be another oblique shock and another flow deflection in region 3, but at a different angle. From the geometry, we'll get the deflection angle to be 10 degrees. Conceptually, the strategy to solve the flows in these two regions are the same. We need to find the normal component of the free stream Mach number use the oblique shock chart to find the beta, and use the normal shock table to obtain the flow properties across the shock. If we look at the strategy in a bit more detail, we need to handle the two oblique shocks separately. Let's label the two cases based on the regions across the shocks. So for the first shock, we'll label that as regions 1 to 2, and the second shock as regions 1 to 3. For each of the case, we'll transform them into a normal shock problem by finding the normal component of the Mach number MN1 equals to M1 sine beta. Now, the beta values for each case is different because the deflection angle delta is different. Continuing with the first case, from the oblique shock chart with M1 equals to 2.3 and delta of 2 degrees, we'll get a beta of about 27 degrees. That will give an MN1 of 1.044. Notice that the value of MN1 is very small, which means that the oblique shock produced will be a very weak wave with small flow compression across the shock. Using this value of MN1, we can read from the normal shock table a value of the pressure ratio P2 over P1. Then, from that value, you can find P2, which is the static pressure acting on the top surface. Because the question doesn't ask for any other parameters, we don't need to read other values from the table. That can save plenty of time when you're solving problems in exams or tests. Using the same process for the bottom surface, with a delta of 10 degrees, and the same M1 and P1, we will get a beta of 34.5 degrees. And that will give you an MN1 of 1.303. Then, you can use that value to find P3 from the normal shock table. The rest of the problem is pretty straightforward to carry through, so I'll leave it to you to complete it to find the final answer. So, these are the main processes in solving problems related to oblique shock waves. Sometimes, for testing purposes, the difficulty level of a problem can be made more difficult by setting up different knowns and unknowns that are given. For example, instead of giving the upstream values of parameters in region 1, we can set them as unknowns, and set the parameters in region 2 as knowns. In this case, you need to solve the problem backward to find the unknowns. That can be figured out if you clearly understand the key processes as explained above. Sometimes you need to apply an iterative process to solve a problem if it cannot be solved directly. We've discussed about how to solve such problems previously in the reflected normal shock topic. But the main idea is pretty much the same, so we don't need to explain that again here. Alright, we've covered everything in this session. In our next session, we will look at cases with reflected oblique shocks. Until then, bye!